hello 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 and welcome back to it's all good i'm your girl latavia and today i am joined by one of my good friends matthew prince king um, he's a fellow i guess eagle met him while i was at central um, and then he you know he went on and went to that other school Name was good. but that's neither here nor there um, Welcome to the show, Max. How are you doing today? I am doing well. And for clarity, I went to Antigua grad school, so I, that sort of kind of don't count really, but I guess it's something I'm going to live with. Okay. I just was say I didn't say when, where, but okay, yes. I just was putting it out there because I know I, it's not as serious to me because I did go to Central for law school or for grad school. But I know that that rivalry between, you know, the Aggie Eagle rivalry is serious. And so. Yeah, it's not, it's not something that we take lightly. Um, exactly. But, so, but it's know, a wonderful it's school. Dope. But it's a wonderful school. Shout out to ANT. Um, it's a great school. So, like I said, but definitely an Eagle at heart. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, yes. And sadly, both of them have canceled homecoming this year. What? Oh, you didn't know? I'm sorry. You can break the news on me <laughs> after we start recording. Oh my God. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you they sent an email out. It has been on, you know. I'm so sorry. That's not You have a track record of doing this, by the way. You know. You have a track record of delivering. Okay, you know what? That's, that's the point. That's that's not the point of today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just this is kind of um a continuation of conversations that you and I have had um, over the years, more so recently, just with kind of, I would say, the, the theme of these last few episodes a lot, with everything that's going on uh, just in the country, in the world, specifically in the country. Um, with protest, uh, we are in a, or it's a census year, it's an election year. Um, a lot of a lot of conversations, a lot of discussions, things going on about like, you know, what do we want? What is, I've heard a lot of people talk about in terms of politics, you know, politicians need to have a black agenda and what is your black agenda? And more so now, I think we are in a, it's a season that's ripe for change. We've, it's, I've, I've felt like we've always been that way, but now more than ever with just all of the attention, you know, all these companies making their PSAs, a lot of them are fake, but, you know, they're doing their PSA. So I'm like, oh, we want to change. We want to do this. We want to do that. I've also heard in the midst of this conversation of, okay, well, what's different? Or where do we go from here? What what, what now? Or, you know, you protest, then what? Or we do this, then what? You took down some statutes. Okay, but what does that change? And so, like I said, I know you and I have had that conversation a lot. So just wanted to, you know, kind of expand that, maybe let let the public in a little bit. Um, but before we do that, I almost forgot. Uh, I'm going to make sure to start off with talking about or sharing something that we're grateful for today. So I know that I unintentionally caught you off guard with the news about homecoming. So uh, I'm trying to, you know, let's try to bring it back to something more positive. What is something that you are grateful for today? Still trying to gather my thoughts to think that we don't have homecoming this year. I'm like, oh my gosh. But I'm really grateful for life health insurance. You know, just being able to wake up for another day and to for whatever right, wrong, or indifferent that um, we're going through, we have another day to have at it and to make it because, you know, everybody didn't get to see that. So I definitely encourage everybody to to do that. That is, that's real. And I mean, it's always been real, but I, I definitely mean like now more than ever, just appreciating life, the little things. Um, that is something I would say these last few months, I have spent more time just trying to appreciate and take, pay attention to. Um, so I would definitely echo that in that I am grateful for life and health. Um, but also, I want to just make a special shout out to my dad because, you know, we're in the season of Father's Day and I know oftentimes fathers don't get 
the credit that they deserve. And so I want to say that I am thankful for him as well as all of the other fathers of men who, whether they are biologically a father, um, they have played that role in someone's life. And then also I'm thinking about the friends that I have who have lost their fathers. And so they they don't have them with them today. And so I know that it's a rough time for them as well. So I'm just, I guess, overall grateful for the people in my life and memories that we all have. And hopefully the memory, you know, focus on the good memories as opposed to the sadness. So. I definitely concur. Hmm? I said I definitely concur. Okay. So with that being said, I guess let's just get into it. Um, reparations is something. <laughs> I, hey, let's just let's just jump in. Reparations. Yeah. It's something we have heard, at least I know most of my life, I have heard about reparations, 40 acres and a mule, like we need to know what is it, but it has been, I would say it's been brought up more in the last year, I think, than ever or in a long time. So you have done a lot of research and spent a lot of time on this, Mr. PhD candidate. Um, for those who don't know what reparations are or who have never heard of it, what would you, I guess, how would you explain that to somebody as what reparation, what is reparations? Um, one, let me preference my comments by saying I'm not telling anybody what to think at all whatsoever. All of my opinions are of my own beliefs and what my truth is. So I, only can encourage you to take what I say and to do your own research to come to your own informed opinion. Um, I graduated from North Carolina Central University in history. I feel as if North Carolina Central is one of the more militant universities <laughs> in the and I mean in the country, honestly. And I really valued my experience in our history department, which led me to you know, a duty bound lifelong journey to research and to, you know, stay abreast of historical events because history is written every day and history changes every day. Um, the, to answer your question directly, the reason for reparations is because once we were free as slaves, when Lincoln, when Lincoln, <clears throat> uh, put in act the Emancipation Proclamation, we didn't have anything. Um, what I would like for us as a community to maybe comprehend, and um, I've heard in a few analogies, so I'm still in this, and shout out to the black sister that I got, I got this from, but um, you know, she said, it's like we played a game with Monopoly and we weren't given a turn for 400 turns. And then just as of recently, we've been told, okay, now for the last 50 turns, we are on an even basis. I think a lot of the issues with reparations stems to the fact that for that 400 years, this country was able to build an enormous amount of wealth without us being able to participate in any of it with out taking in the consideration that we were the labor force to actually construct it. So, you know, there's no way to unmarry the relationship between black labor and American wealth. We built it for them for free, you know, so if we could take that into consideration, you know, all of these, you know, I, you know I'm an entrepreneur and I know, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs and just business people in general, majority of their overhead is labor if they could cut the cost of their labor out and still get what they needed done do you understand the difference of how your company would be able to operate so to be able to build free enterprise in a variety of different sectors it wasn't just agriculture it was you know the steel mills it was textiles it was shipping it was what they want to, us to believe is that they stole ignorant barbaric uncivilized people from Africa, when in all actuality, they stole scientists, they stole engineers, they stole professors. Like we had whole civilizations both in Africa and in America, message. 
but that's for a different conversation. So they, you know, the Europeans were able to galvanize our skill set in order to build the wealth of this particular country. And when they let us free, Abraham Lincoln knew that they owed us a debt. So what was agreed was that we were going to get 40 acres in the mule. After they shot Abraham Lincoln, um, Andrew Johnson, I believe, uh, flipped the script completely and wanted to, keep, for the sake of keeping the union together, he let the South run wild, which actually created the, you know, essence of what the Ku Klux Klan were, because the Klan were pretty much the terrorists that went around reclaiming the land in the South. Like Hilton Head, South Carolina, for example, was all black, but now Hilton Head is one of the, you know, much more pristine places, destinations for white people in South Carolina. Uh, and I mean, that Wilmington, North Carolina is another example of how, you know, Throughout the duration of slavery, um, Reconstruction, post-Reconstruction, Jane and Jim Crow, we've both pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and we've also um, asked them to amend or take care of the bill that they've ran up. And in both scenarios, we've come up short. You know, we, we actually had a, a Freedmen's Bureau. A Freedmen's Bureau was an actual government agency that was in charge of distributing reparations. So it is not as if this country does not know or does not have the historical track record to know that we've been having this conversation since we left the plantation. Exactly. So. <laughs> so what is reparations? I'm sorry. I know I said a lot. Okay. So what is reparations? <laughs> I was Rep- saying, I'm trying to figure out how to I'm like. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So I, 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 I remember. I'm sorry. But let me be, get back to that. That was a little historical background on yes. what it was. But reparations specifically is the atonement, whether economically speaking, spiritually speaking, um, socially speaking of a wrongdoing from one group to another group. So for example, um, the most famous, I think, reparation case, intentionally or not, is the Jewish Holocaust. Okay. They put a lot of attention to it. So after the Jews left Germany, they literally were designated land in Palestine to create a whole new country. So when we think about the state of Israel, the state of Israel, I believe, was created in like 1947, something like that, somewhere around that area. Before then, there was no such thing as Israel. The whole concept of Israel's is reparations, the entire concept of the com- country is reparations. And this was what they said that God had ordained for them to have to make sure that the Holocaust for them never happened again. So we never shed an eye at them. And as a matter of fact, as a country, for a country that did not, not and, you know, we alluded to this in our conversation, not only did we not kill any Germans, <laughs> I mean, any Jewish Germans, but we went over there to fight for their freedom. But yet we're the ones right. that still giving them billions of dollars in reparations every year. So another example is the uh, American Japanese people who were rounded up in World War II. And then they, yes, ma'am. And by all means, it was crazy. It was terrible. But it might have lasted four or five years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At most. You know, so I'm not I'm not dismissing it, nor am I dismissing the Holocaust. The Holocaust is the same way. Like it was terrible, but it may have lasted four or five years at most. So for as terrible as these events were, if we put them in a timeline to the totality of what the American Negro had to go through, it's a drop in a bucket. It's a drop in a bucket. So ultimately what I would love to say is Regardless of what we talk about with reparations, what I know in my heart's of hearts is there's not enough money in their banks. It's not, it's not enough gold in their vaults. It's not, not enough oil in their wells. It's not enough chickens in their coops for them to be able to pay fully what they have done to us as a people. It's impossible. So the only thing we can do is start the conversation from where we are right now, which is the fact that if you look at any social ailment of black people, I can direct so directly back, beeline it directly back to the social economic status of where we are as a people. 
whether we're talking about education, crime, family structure, um, societal status, police brutality, whatever we want to do, I can take it back to the fact that we are a economically oppressed people. And, you know, me and you, me and you laugh about it. And no offense to anybody who's younger or older, but I will continuously <laughs> say that this is this reparations fight is an 80s babies fight. I'm telling you, it's an 80s babies fight. And it's very important because what we allow for this country to do to us is manipulate the fact that they want us to feel like they somehow worked their way into their privilege. Like somehow their uh, American exceptionalism and their manifest destiny was something that not only God ordained, but they feel like they are the sole proprietor owner of what has manifested of this country. When in all actuality, if they did not have the free labor that they were given, they wasn't about to be out there picking all that cotton. They wouldn't about to be. But you know, they're going to say, hey, but we did do it. Like we got that. We brought them over. We made sure it worked. All, you know, all of that foolishness that I don't agree with, but I'm saying that is, those are arguments or rebuttals that I think some. For free? So you want me to be. I, like I said, I'm not, I'm, I guess some are playing devil's advocate, but not really, but it's just, these are some of the things that I've heard in terms of the response of, well, wait, hey, I didn't own slaves. We still had to go and make the deals and do this and do that. It's, it's BS, but. I, I truly believe that there are some some white people who believe, like they genuine believe, genuinely believe that, hey, no, my ancestors did work for this. They built this country. Like they can't, I don't know why or how, but they can't seem to reconcile the fact that, okay, yes, they may have owned it, but, but for the free labor, but for the 400 plus years of free labor that they were able to get, because of the chattel slavery that America created, you wouldn't be where you are. And to me, I don't, I'm, I'm learning to accept some things. It's just not for me to understand because I cannot fathom how you can't make that connection. Like it's not that difficult to make that connection that America is where it is today because of slavery. And based off of that uh, school of thought, that would, if I was a German person to say, hey, I didn't put any of y'all's ancestors in any of those death concentration camps. I was, you know, American right now. Like, why are we giving Japanese people, you know, any money? I wasn't alive when FDR and them put them in tournament camps. If I look at any of the Native Americans, like, I didn't put any of them on the Trail of Tears. How'd they get casinos? So. Exactly. It don't make it, sense. Correct. It becomes a redundant conversation, but what ends up happening is because we don't stand firm on where we are, just because they don't agree with it, don't mean that we still don't go for it. And that's the difference of, between political power, because political power, they don't do favors. It's not about favors. It is very much when to quote to pro. I don't, I'm pretty sure I just messed up that, uh, that, that phrase of whatever they be accusing Trump of. Uh, but it's very much a, a mutual beneficial relationship. Like, I'm going to do something for you. You're going to do something for me. That's just strictly how politics work. And what ends up happening is we stand off of our footing in regards to understanding what is going to progress us as a people in this country. Now, let's take a step back and refer back to where we were with reparations and why that was important. Um, when you look at, at the institutions of wealth in our country, they come from generational money. So for example, somebody like the Bus family who owns the Lakers, you know, they're they are now in a generation where everybody a part a part of their ownership was born in that ownership. So, you know, when you look at somebody like Kyrie now saying, hey, let's go do our own thing, and you seeing all the other slaves saying, nah, we got good masters. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. Why we go start our own thing? I want to do no Negro leagues. Um, that That is a direct reflection of what our mentality was leaving our plantation. Because if you strip a people of their religion, their spirituality, their tongues, their, their nationality, their identity uh, for so long, and then you send them out to civilization, you are going to get what we have in our American society where you can have somebody as 
uh, black as uh, Tyreek Nasheed and then have somebody as Oreo as Clarence Thomas. And I mean, I'm not someone to get into labels per se. That's more so a stereotype because I gave them labels. But I, I believe that I, in the sense of we, you know, Joe Biden said you ain't black unless you vote Democrat. I believe that black people, we can be as diverse as we want to be. To think that we are monolithic people is to be like is a misnomer. So I always grant that freedom for black people to have their own thought as long as they just remember that they're black first. And that's not to make it seem as if nothing else of your life is of importance. But, you know, even biblically speaking, when we talk about the least of these, if I translate that scripture into the practicality of this society, it's going to be black people that qualify as the least of these. We quali- you know, our housing is the least of these. Our education is the least of these. Our food access is the least of these. Our, uh, our access to justice to the criminal, sus- uh, sy- uh, criminal justice system is the least of these. So there's, um, there's nothing about the plight of where we are right now, where the, the phrase that I hate right now is the, uh, something is the new black. Nothing is the new black. Not orange, not blue, not purple. Nothing is the new black. You know what I'm saying? Nothing is the new black. I don't care in what scenario it is, because again, if you're talking about the wealthiest country in this world, again, if we're playing Monopoly 400 turns and the last 50 turns, you're finally telling me I can go, but yet on your board, you've literally bought everything up. There's nothing else to buy on this board. So literally the only way that I'm going to be able to get some wealth is if you share the wealth because the whole board is built up. Not only that, but you have four get out of free jail passes compared to when I turn, when I finally roll, I don't have anything I land on. I'm a rent. I'm not going to own it. You own everything. And, correct. And not only did you get four more get out of G, get out of jail free passes. I got four times the, Go to jail now on the road, you know. So, yeah, correct. So, the whole when we talk about racism, we have a very not we, some people who have a platform have a very mis uh, uninformed understanding of what racism is. Racism is not me calling somebody a cracker and they calling me that's not what racism is, that's bigotry and it's prejudice. And we all can have that. And we all do have that. Um, so, you know, that's just as bad as when, um, you know, the way that we, you and I were talking about the interaction between male and female and how oppressive black men can be to black women, you know, being able to have that open dialogue to, you know, not take out our frustrations of what this society gives us to our help. So, you know, in that sense, we, you know, my mom used to say, if it wasn't black or white, it'd be short and tall. You know what I'm saying? Like we were figuring a way as humans to be able to divide ourselves, which is honestly true because in Africa, in Nigeria, for example, my best friend's Nigerian. But if you would have told me prior to me doing a little research about any Nigerian that I knew, I would have thought that they were all the same Nigerian because it was just one nation. But it's literally like three different major tribes that make up Nigeria that come, that talk different languages, they eat different foods. Whatever the case may be. So, what I'm, I say that to say, Muhammad Ali had a, a great analogy when he was talking about falcons hang out with falcons, cardinals hang out with cardinals, bluebirds hang out with bluebirds. Like, you know, it is not abnormal to want to be amongst your people. So, when white people scream white power, I'm not mad at white people. What I am mad at is when those ideas can affect the quality of my day. And that is the only time that racism comes into play. If you can affect the quality of my life, now you have the power to be racist. And the reason why institutional racism is such a power grab is because they have figured out how to metamorph their racism over time to where it was so much, it was so overt during, you know, uh, post reconstruction and Jim and Jane Crow, they had the Ku Klux Klan going crazy, lynching the man every day to where they say, you know what? We don't have to do this as much. We can take the robes off and then we can put on police uniforms and then we can, you know, become school teachers and then we can become DAs. And, you know, their their ideology 
has become a lot more systematic than it was just spewing out. And the reason why they could become racist is because they could perform a Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they literally could come down and burn down our whole city. They could perform a Wilmington, North Carolina, where they could come down and burn up down our whole city, uh, a Rosewood, Florida, where they could come down and burn down our whole city. So Philadelphia. Correct. So, you know, the only time we've ever shown self-determination from a militant standpoint, the FBI said we were the most dangerous state of the country. So, you know, we've never had. Yeah. yeah and, and, and we weren't going around bombing people. <laughs> we didn't go around lynching white folks like that no. wasn't. We just had the nerve to go get educated, create our own economic systems and survive and dwell on our own and not buy, mind our business. You know, mind we, our business. Had, we had the unmitigated gall to go become successful and create ecosystems amongst ourselves, which and you you touched on a whole lot of things. Um, in case you weren't aware, anytime you talk to him, you're going to get a history lesson. Um but it's no, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I'm just trying to make sure, I guess trying to figure out ways to break it down. But like I said, you touched on a lot of things, but specifically, I guess, thinking about Tulsa, Wilmington, the name escapes me, but you know, the, the group of people in Philadelphia where they bought, they set it on fire. Um, just even Durham, um, Black Wall Street, like there's, there's numerous stories or scenarios where there were specifically after reconstruction where okay there were some black people who were like okay we're free we're not just physically free but we are they they got mentally free and they went and they took okay we were doing this for them for free now we're going to do it for ourselves and we're going to become you know they became successful they created their own systems there were there were towns um you know that whole concept of it takes a village it was literally a village there was a community but whenever they got, even historically, when we get successful, and not just where there's a one-off, when it's collective, when we pull our resources, and it's seen like, oh, wait, they're working together. It's not the same, but even I, I thought about like the whole Tower of Babel, like when the people got together, like, oh, we're going to build this tower so we can go all the way up to heaven and we can meet God. Like, And God was like, hey, hold up. No. I'm going to make everyone speak different languages and I'm going to scatter you because you're trying to, I'm, I'm happy that you realize you can, when you come together, you can accomplish something great, but you're now trying to come together and accomplish something that is not great or of, of evil intent. Um, and I think because clearly history has shown us that why people have perverted the Bible and perverted the, the scriptures to things that work for them and it's in the same sense of hey like oh you can have a few people because you know you can have your we can let you have athletes that get famous you can have your music people your celebrities they can get it we'll have we're we're cool with a few people becoming billionaires and millionaires that's fine because it's just them it's not the collective whole but whenever there's a sense of like hold up they talking, they meeting, they figuring it out, and they're pulling the resources. And now, they because they know how powerful we are. They know the yeah. effects. Um, like, yeah. When yeah. That. yeah. But yeah, they know that when when we get together, and when and it's they see that, and that's when you know we get put on the FBI most wanted. Um, I was reading about or just listening to something about Eartha Kitt, even how they created because she had the nerve to speak her mind and to call uh was it president johnson and his wife out and just actually talk about all of the things that were going on she had a platform and she used it they they based they turned her into a criminal overnight like a person of interest like her whole family to where she had to leave the country for her safety and so it's just like history has shown that over and over again when we realize oh wait who we are and the power that we have in just who we are and then collectively they try to destroy it. But I just, it's like at this point, and you know, I've seen that we're done dying. Enough is enough, uh, which I'm happy. And I'm, I'm, I'm part of me is like, you know, why does it take, why did we have to get here for this to happen? But we're here now. I'm happy. Let's keep the pressure going. Um, but in the, com in the thought of, okay, what are we demanding? What are we requiring? I'm hopeful that we will realize like, okay, we don't, we don't need 
to keep waiting on someone or something to happen to save us or to make a difference. Like we are the ones we've been waiting on. Um, you say it's an eighties baby fight. Uh, you know, that could be a part of it. Eighties babies. And at this point, nineties babies, it's a, it's a millennial facts. Why whoever's after us, I don't know. Like, but yes, because it is, it is incumbent upon us to, to get up and take action to, to do something. And, and it's like, so to that point, like I said, even thinking of the whole conversation of reparations, it's not a new concept. It's not a new conversation, but in, when you think about timing makes a difference, if there was ever a time to press in, to push for and demand reparations, the time is now. And there have been various studies. I know they passed something about a approving a commission to study about reparations, which I think is ridiculous. All the studies that need to be done, in my opinion, are done. Um, there's actually one, I, I have not read all of it, but there's one I was reading about. Um, it's by a group of people, but it's called What We Get Wrong About Closing the Racial Wealth Wealth Gap. It's by William Darity Jr., Derek Hamilton, Mark Paul, Alan Aja, Ann Price, Antonio Moore, and Katerina C. I don't know how to say her last name, but it's from the out of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equality at Duke. Um, but it's and in that report, they go through and break down just all the different like, OK, hey, here's what you've gotten wrong. Here are the issues. Here are the concerns. And then spell out the um, like how much in terms of reparations we need, how it will be distributed, who it goes for. Um, and I know you and I were talking about. I guess earlier this month, uh, Bob Johnson put out a report and he's done a series of interviews and talking about reparations and what he, his views on it. And so there's a lot of different views, but outside of, and I've even been, I guess, privy to some conversations recently where it's like, okay, yes, we all, we're in agreement. We need, you know, we should get reparations. It's deserved. At the very least, the country needs to just acknowledge, yes, slavery happened, apologize for it, atonement. And then this is what we're going to do. Like here are actual tangible things we're going to do. One of the main needing to be cut the check. Um, but aside from that, what are some other ways or other things that you think reparations need to look like or should like, should look like? Um, definitely. But before I uh, answer that question, to recap the historical uh, rant, in regards to why they should cut the check is because we need to understand reparations to be able to extend beyond slavery. So when we think about reparations, we only think about slavery, which is absolutely true. But the misnomer is the fact that one, we work for free during slavery. And then when they let us go during reconstruction and post-reconstruction, we built for ourselves and then they still came into the destroyed it. So we've try to assimilate within this country both ways and both ways they need to compensate us for our free work or allowed us to build our own wealth. So we do need another comp comprehensive study on uh, Black Wall Street, on um, on on Harlem, on, on Tulsa, on, on Rosewood, on all of these communities. And what would have, what would have they been, can't talk, what would have come of those communities had they been able to stay intact? What wealth would what wealth would have been able to be established by that, um, and then to even throw the fight over into the war on drugs. So that's the current that's the current evolution of the system of oppression that we're in. So it went from slavery to Jim and Jane Crow to the war on drugs, and that's where we currently are right now in in this particular fight. Um, so the importance of cutting the check is that's. We live in a capitalistic society. In order to be successful in a capitalistic society, you have to have access to capital. It ain't no two ways about it. <laughs> it ain't no two ways about it. You know what I'm saying? Cash. I, don't, I, don't, I don't. You can have as many grants as you want, programs as you want, whatever. Welfare programs, whatever. We live in a capitalistic society. Those who create the rules have access to capital. The reason why we don't have control of any parts of our community is because we don't have access to capital. Um, I have to go over this before I move on to it because I don't want to miss out on it. 
the reason another thing our community has to do is we have to hold our own black leadership accountable. Um, and it's not to say that we condemn or don't appreciate what they may have done for us as a community, may have not done for us as a community, but we do have to be critical of the decisions that they made because now we are the ones that are living with what they decided to do. And in my personal belief, a lot of the times should be up. So for example, those who supported the, the civil rights bill, um, it was one of those things where we were able to gain social equality, where we could go to school with people, we can go eat at their restaurants and everything else. But we did that at the cost of losing our own economy. So we got the social quality, lost our own economy. And then what the civil rights bill did was instead of continuing the language of black, Negro, and color that specifically spoke to our people, how you would find in legislation prior to the civil rights bill, it metamorphed into minorities. And then as soon as you use the term minorities, now you have a very vague, ambiguous term that can apply to anybody. And that's exactly what happened. And the legislation of the civil rights bill that allowed for all these immigrants to come into our communities with these low interest loans and the set up nail shops and gas stations and hair stores. So it's not a, it's not coincidence that any community you go to in this community, the Arabs are going to be owning the gas station or the, you know, Asians are going to be running the, the hair markets or the like the government set this up through their low interest programs and their uh, immigrant programs that they've been having since Jump Street. The, pro the home Homestead Act, they've been giving out land <laughs> for immigrants since they started. So they ain't never been they never been new. What happened is they just opened up our community to allow them to come in to exploit our community. So we would have services in our community. Can't nobody say that we went without, but we don't own it. So, you know, when people start talking about we're running down our own community, we don't own nothing in our community. We don't own it. We don't own the grocery stores. We don't own the gas stations. We don't own the, 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 the malls, the strip malls. We don't own no parts of it. So do I feel like there's a better way do, do I feel like we have to burn it down yet? Then no, nah, I don't feel like we have to burn it down yet. But I feel like there's certain conversations that we should be able to have to say, like, if this is the climate and all of you guys are so remorseful, I heard that uh, Nike gave a billion dollars and Michael gave a hundred million. You know, we need some accountability to where all this money is going. You know, if not, this is a whole bunch of hot air and fluff, you know, because of a black man like me, I support, I support the motto and the spirit of what Black Matter, Lives Matter is, but I've done my research. And my own personal truth is I don't support the organization because I know who is pulling the strings and the personal strings of that organization. And what I would warn Black people to do is we need to take a step back from all of this emotion. And I know that we can be emotional, but what I, we don't want to do is we don't want to make decisions based off emotion. We want to harness that energy and we want to have a stand -up to make sure that we can endure something for a long lasting change. So when we are asking, okay, what, why, why do we need to check? We need to check because at every level of our societal structure, we need reform. So you can't tell me that you're about to sit here and, you know, give us money for education, but get Shaw and Morehouse and St. Aug and uh, uh, Howard and all these universities look the way that they do. You know, you've already stated clearly that you don't care about the institutions that we have. So we need to be able to regentrify ourselves. And, and and the biggest thing is they love to harp on our behavior, how black people act. But, but very seldom do they put emphasis on the environment which we are forced to be raised in. And all of that, again, <laughs> reverts back to the lack of resources. Um, so money aside. When you, we were talking about this yesterday, um, one of the things I would do for black people when we get our reparations check is have a program where it, we would have to go through mandatory mental counseling as a community in order to receive all of our money. So you may get one disbursement and then you have to finish all of your other sessions in order to get it because we are a traumatized people. And we're more traumatized than we recognize. 
And until you understand that you have been traumatized, you can't go about fixing it. So, for example, when I was at ANT, we would work with soldiers coming from war in the, in our gardens, and they it was called occupational therapy. And the whole idea is the military trains you to be a killer. Every aspect of your way of life when you're getting trained is to kill. So if you send somebody to theater and they are used to being in a combat zone and all they know is war, it's hard for them to transition back into civilian life where ain't nobody think about war but them. So now they are, you know, to where they were exactly where they needed to be mentally in that war zone. Once they come back home, now they're out of it. And now they're beating on their wife. Now they're beating on their kids. Now they killing themselves. You know what I'm saying? So it, there was a need for them to reverse that trauma in order for them to be whole again. You know, black people, we've never been made whole ever as a community. They've never, and you know, my thing is I'm beyond an apology. If you if we wanted a sincere apology, cut the check. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> I don't want guys to me in the form of cash. I, that's the only apology that I want from white people. That's the I don't, that's the only thing. I don't want nothing else from them. I don't want nothing symbolic. I don't want no days. I don't want no kneelings. I don't want no no I don't want any more programs. There's you have you have shown yourself to be a terrible steward of our communities. So in the spirit of how Chinatown and these Jewish districts and you know even these LGBT districts that I've seen that look like literally they're cities that are big enough where whole communities that have like-minded people within them are able to dwell and that they are able to control the resources within that particular area. There's no reason why in this country we in our communities we don't have the resources in order to man- maintain them outside of the fact that somebody has intentionally kept these resources from us. So it would be, it would be, it would be remiss for me to try to harp on things that were not economic when it comes to reparations, because then I would be kind of leaning towards asking them to fix something that I feel like we could fix for ourselves. So, okay. And just to, I guess, interject. So you mentioned in terms of, you know, cut the check, mental health requirement um but even as you were talking about the excuse me little italy's chinatown all the different little subsets of these other communities or populations have created their own things and then they own things um it reminded me something that uh, bob johnson mentioned and or i guess he articulated some thoughts that i had in the sense of we our communities are considered the ghettos, the hood, like we all are grouped there, whether it be in the sense of someone who, you know, in a poverty area, or even those in the so-called middle class. Um, We live in them, but rarely do we own the overall like area. And we have become, even though we're not the primary, we're not the majority of people on welfare, a lot of the social programs, but it's like, when we use the, the programs, I think have been given as like, hey, I'm not going to actually give you money, but I'll give you something to where you're dependent on it. And it's become the modern version of slavery in the sense of, yeah, no, you're not working for free, but I'm still creating this system where you as or black people collectively are still reliant on white people. But in this sense, it's the government. And we have... And I say we, I know it's not every single one of us, but just collectively, we are still dependent and beholden to them. And even in, and he used the example of black people, for the most part, vote Democrat, basically since the 60s with with Kennedy or the late 50s, 60s. And it's become a thing of no matter what, I'm voting Democrat, I'm voting down the ticket. And it's like, yes, voting is important. And for those of you who have not registered to vote, I encourage you to go get registered um, and to, to actually vote. But it's we have for too long become just, oh, we're a one party ticket or one. Like if it's Democrat, I'm voting for it. If it's Republican, it's not for me. I am i don't care what they're saying. I'm just this is the way I'm voting. And that to me has done us a disservice because we're not holding the same way you mentioned earlier about holding our our leaders accountable, black, white, and, and indifferent. We need to hold 
<clears throat> accountable and not just keep voting, oh, just because you're Democrat. Well, my grandma voted Democrat, so whatever. But if they're not putting forth things um, that are in our best interest, if they, okay, you voted for them the first time, thinking of, uh, you know, like senators and representatives or even on the local level, okay, we put you in. Now, what are you going to do for us? What have you done for us? And if you are not doing things and are not doing things in our interest, then we're going to vote you out. And like, that's just one example. Um, and even like tying it back into reparations, you mentioned, you know, okay, we get the check. I think another requirement should be financial literacy because, because for so long we have not collectively had wealth. Um, and there is this big gap. We don't know, we don't know large part of, we just don't, we don't know what to do with money. We don't even know how to, conceptualize wealth like to even and I know even for myself like I, I'm doing well I'm doing okay but you know there's a lot of things that I've learned by trial and error when it comes to finances um because one of the things that you know you, you got to pay your bills because if you don't pay your bills you that opens a door for them to, you know something else for them to come in but I think in connection with getting okay hey you get this check you get this big lump sum of money I want us to have some financial literacy to go along with it. I think it would be great if we could get that where that's a mandatory piece of education in general. But if not, definitely for us, even if it's us doing it and requiring it for ourselves, if that makes sense. Like, um, I think that's something that, OK, we get it because I, I could see if, you know, when the agreement is made, OK, yes, we're going to cut the check but we're going to cut some of these other social programs um, or we're going to reduce them, which I think there should be a reduction in them anyway. And I know that's something that we've talked about as well, but what I, I don't want to happen is, okay, you get this big lump sum of money, you get all excited and you go buy everything. And then two months, a year, two years, it's all gone. You have nothing to show for it. It has not been, it has not, done or served the purpose it was intended to but at that point we can't point the finger at them anymore it's now back on us and so I think we have to get back to collectively holding each other accountable um, for that and say okay you got it now how are you going to use it and that even makes me think back to for those few of us who have done well, who are wealthy, who have obtained it, um, there are members of the black community who, you know, when they've gotten successful, they give back, they, you know, donate money or they donate their time, resources, whatever. But I think it's too many of us who have that they get it and, you know, quote unquote, forget where they came from and they don't come back and teach what they've learned. Uh, it's like, which I think is just kind of that's if you learn it, then I need, if I learned it and I've been successful, then I need to, at the very least, I need to go back and teach somebody so that they can duplicate it and it doesn't die with me. Because I think that's the other challenge is because it's okay. I worked hard. I did what I need to do. I got successful. I got mine. And now I'm looking out for me in my circle, but forget the rest of y'all. Like y'all need to figure it out. I'm And Obviously, there's. We are not a monolith. There are multiple things that it can't all be fixed overnight. But like I said, and now I feel like I'm on a tangent. But just though, like I said, that's one thing that I think about in terms of if we're going to once we get the money, what we internally need to do individually. I'm with it, and to one of your comments in regards to. Um, you know, us being on their social programs. Uh, this country has housed and fed their slaves since the day we stepped off the boat. Ain't nothing changed about it. You know, the slave quarters have turned into EBTs. And to, I mean, the slave quarters have turned into public housing. And, you know, our rations have turned into our EBT vouchers. So no, until we are able to mentally free ourselves from that dependency, then, you know, that's why I separate the conversations. I only want to talk money to white people. Just fight out. Because the fact that they know that we need financial literacy 
that's what they use as a catalyst to say that they don't want to give us reparations. When in all actuality, they ain't got nothing to do with they ain't none of y'all business. To your point, though, um, I and the funny thing about you know black people is the fact that we they say we don't have literacy, but you know we have literally created an entire black market for ourselves within our own communities and have for years. Um, before slavery, we ran Timbuktu. I w- if, if people don't know about Timbuktu, I would love for them to look that up on your free time and how that was the economic center of the world, ran by black people. So we, it is not that white people didn't create capitalism, enterprise, commerce, trade. We were over here in America doing that and in Mexico doing that 200 years before they ever even knew that this part existed. So I said all that to say, all y'all sipping on the Bernie juice, get off of the Bernie juice. You know what I'm saying? Like we need to be able to be self-determined for ourselves again and to make sure that everybody has a place within society, which is going back to our village mentality. But everybody has a gift and a skill set that they can manifest if they have the environment to nurture that. And that's what we want to get back to in regards to the reparations. Once we get the check, now it's going back to redesigning our environment. You know, what does it take in order for these kids to seek their full potential? How can we reimagine what our educational system looks like? How can we imagine what our policing system looks like? How can we imagine what our food system looks like? But now we have the resources to do it. Now this just ain't a pipe dream. And, you know, the thing that I, I, I you know, the one thing about I me, mean, you know, specified generation, we want to go save the world. But mo- most of the times, every time our friends want to go save the world, the first thing they want to do is find a grant writer. You know, that's not how this country operates. <laughs> and, you know, to your point when you were talking about, you know, people talking about, oh, I got it. And, um, you know, you, you know, they should come back and give it to us. You're absolutely right. But to refer back to my point of reparation, the wealth gap is so far that Kim Kardashian can't make a bad decision and all the Kardashians lose their money. You know, so what, so what ends up happening is they got layers and layers of cushion to be able to make the mistakes. So what happens is in our family, there's two or three that rise to the top that ends up being the catalyst for the entire family in order to pull them to the next cycle. But it's not as if we make generational strides. You know, we may make it one more inch than where our parents made. And if we can get our kids to go one more inch than where we made it, then we feel like that's success. And and to an Everybody. extent, it is, but in the grand I mean, scheme of thing, it's, it things, it's not. It, when you want to talk about a uh, collective change, a right. collective change, it's almost my sister made the best analogy the other day. She was talking about, you know, if you have a plot of sunflowers and you have, you know, 10, 15 sunflowers and, you know, you water them and you nurture them and everything the case may be, and you only get two or three of them to pop up. You don't get excited and be like, whoa, look how beautiful those two or three. Oh, my God. Look how, you know, you immediately are distraught because you're trying to figure out why is not why what is going on in the soul? What is it about the soul? Because I can't yell at the other plants like, why are you not growing like these plants? You know, they they, they, they talk about, you know, roses growing from concrete. Shout out to Pop. Talking about roses growing from concrete. And the real question should be is, why should a rose have to grow from concrete in the first place? That's not where roses grow. So, you know, sometimes the roses that grow from concrete, you talk about that 10% type of mentality somewhat where they're yelling at the rest of the 90, like, why are you not growing? When in all actuality, the soil is not conducive for growth. There's not enough nutrients in the soil. There's not enough support in the soil. There's not enough water in the soil in order for all these flowers to be able to grow up and reach their full potential. And for us, we... It's a two-fold conversation. It's a phase one and phase two conversation. Phase one, my personal opinion, Black people, you ain't got to believe me, uh, but what I'm going to say is do your research on Black Lives Matter and and Tifa and um, the police unions and uh, the fraternal order of police. Like, Really look at all the chest or pieces and research everything, all sides, and then come up to your with your own conclusion. But please don't listen to what the you know, just don't go with what the TV says. That's not, that's, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be smart. Um, once you're able to come up to your own understanding of where your anger lies, I'm not telling us to be angry. What I'm telling is we need to harness this in order to 
go through a long lasting change. And we were talking about this yesterday. The effectiveness of the Montgomery boycotts wasn't just the fact that they were out in the streets with signs and pickets. They literally kept their asses off the bus for a whole year. I'm sorry, cuss, but yeah. they they were it was a they, little over a year. I think it was like 380 something days. So yes, they did. I think about just trying to do. Ooh, I'm gonna just eat different. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna not eat something for 21 days, and that's a struggle. So, like when you think about over a, a whole year, year they, a lot of people did. A lot of people didn't have cars. A lot of people didn't have a way to work. A lot of people had more than enough reasons to say that. Uh, did, but I would be remiss. I would be remiss if I did not bring up also the point of the Montgomery boycotts was the fact that we wanted social assimilation so bad that we sacrificed our own bus lines during that time. We had three very successful black bus lines before the Montgomery boycotts. And because we thought that white people's ice was colder, we wanted to get on their buses and we sacrificed what we had of ourselves. So what I would like for us to take into this consideration is me personally, I'm beyond asking white people to be nice to me. I'm beyond asking them to do something for me. Like at this point, this is a business relationship. And what I liked about what uh, OG Bob Johnson was talking about was the fact that, um, you know, there's a, a theory that we should gravitate towards in regards to instead of having permanent friends politically, we should have only yeah. permanent interests. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, don't worry about who's nice to you or like that's that's irrelevant. That is so irrelevant because no other ethnic group plays politics like that. So when North Korea and, and the U.S. play politics, it ain't about Trump can cuss and fuss all he want. When he talking to China, he can cuss and fuss all he want. But when it comes down to them tariffs, that's all about negotiations. And what we need to get out of is out of our emotions and back and say, OK, Nike, you really sad or are you really mad? Let's go with what the Jewish people did. And what they did was they went after the private sector companies that had anything, something, if, if they had anything to do with the Holocaust, they were going to go soon. And that's how they got their reparations real fast. Because France and all these other European countries, they had to protect their interests because all these countries, they was about, they were going to lose a lot of money. And if we went back and started, you know how many insurance companies? I think uh, Dr. Claude Anderson and, and, you know, Dr. Claude Anderson is another brother in the struggle that has been doing it for a long time. And if you don't know about him, look him up. But you know, I think he said it was roughly around 240 uh, of the Fortune 500 companies in America was made strictly based off of slavery. Like directly. So if we took lawsuits to them and say, hey, look, we suing for y'all participation in slavery, Jim and Jane Crow, uh, and what y'all making off of the war on drugs. And we're going to take that as a lawsuit. And I, we on code. Black people, we on code. Like conservatives, liberals, heterosexuals, homo whatever. It don't like we on code because what we saying is we doing this as a collective. Whatever differences we may have right now are irrelevant. We don't care. Everybody in within our villages, that's who we are taking care of right now. Whatever we want to do once we get this, that's why we are such a diverse people. Like we talk about Africa in the sense of like it's some type of country. Africa is a whole continent. It's so many. If you want to see the diversity of black people, look into Africa and then go through all of the 60 some countries that they have in there and see how many different ways we can be black. So, you know, I don't ever want to put all of us into one box to say that, you know, we got to be lockstep lifestyle and habits and whatever the case may be. But we need to be lockstep in our interests. Whatever is the, the commonality with, with the, within all of us, all of us could become homeowners. All of us should be able to have life insurance on our people. All of us should be able to send our kids to school. That shouldn't be predicated on any any type of party lines or any type of de demographics or geographics, period. But that's a, that's a phase two conversation where we got to be mature enough to be like, you know, we're going to do this for the greater good of all of us. And once we get past this, then we need to reflect on, um, as you were speaking, what is it that we need to do to move forward politically to make sure we can maintain this sustainable change? So if it's talking about like, you know, for me, politically, where I stand is I stand on reparations. If you do not politically support me on reparations, I cannot politically support you. It is not the fact that I don't like you. 
or, you know, we can't go out to dinner or we can't, you know, sit, you know, watch a basketball game. It, it ain't, it'll have nothing to do with none of that. Hey, thank you so much for listening. Like this conversation is going really, really great, but I just want to stop here. We're going to take a pause and I do hope you enjoyed it. Like make sure you take a note, take this time to go back and re-listen Um, Look up some of the people we talked about so you can start educating yourselves. Um, And then stay tuned. Next week, part two will be out. So in the meantime, if you haven't, make sure that you subscribe uh, to podcast. Uh, We we are now on YouTube. So subscribe to the channel. Like, comment, share. Um, Let me know your thoughts. And see you next week.